Good morning. My name is Sarah Weiner, Program Manager of Education and Practice at the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health. Thank you for joining us for today's ASPPH Presents webinar, Public Health and Architecture Interdisciplinary Collaboration, as we hear about two interdisciplinary educational endeavors between architecture and public health. Today's webinar will be one hour in length. We will begin with an introduction by our moderator, followed by two presentations lasting approximately 15 minutes each and ending with a question and answer period. The webinar is part of the 2016 ASPPH Presents monthly series, which has been designed as a service to CEPH accredited ASPPH member schools and programs of public health. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the ASPPH website in the archived webinar section soon. Additionally, this webinar has been approved for one hour of CPH continuing education credit. The webinar is sponsored by the Framing the Future, the Second 100 Years of Public Health, a national consensus effort undertaken by ASPPH with hundreds of public health and practice partners, as well as partners from other sectors and disciplines. We would also like to thank the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Centers for Surveillance, Epidemiology, and Laboratory Sciences for their support. A few housekeeping items of note. While you are in listen-only mode and your lines have been muted, we encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation by using the question box. We will address your questions at the end of the presentation. We are pleased to have with us today our moderator, Ruth Gar Bernheim, Chair of the Department of Public Health Sciences in the School of Medicine, as well as co-director of the Institute for Practical Ethics and Public Life at the University of Virginia. She is the founding director of the Master of Public Health program at UVA and teaches courses on public health law, ethics, and policy. Among many other positions, Ruth also serves as the chair of the Framing the Future Population Health Across All Professions expert panel. Thank you for being here today, Ruth. And thank you, Sarah. I'd like to offer my um, own warm welcome to everyone who joined the call and to um, it, it sort of give a context and background for our conversation today. So for those of you involved with public health education, you know these are really exciting times. Uh, we have a new spirit uh, and energy for innovation, and much of it has been catalyzed by uh, the Framing the Future Task Force, which for a number of years has been engaging our colleagues in public health, our professionals in uh, other schools and disciplines, and our public health workforce in saying, what is the vision of public health education for the future. So we have a number of new um, d competencies and um, pro programs uh, and projects that are looking at our degrees as well as how we collaborate with others for interdisciplinary education. Um, one particular aspect of Framing the Future was a task force on population health across all professions that I had the honor to co-chair uh, with a number of other colleagues. And the expert panel released its report on, in March 2015, and a number of major um, encouragements or um, uh, take-home messages. So the considerations were effective education in public health and in population health um, is bi-directional. We need to have stronger collaboration and reach across um, our uh, disciplines in schools so that uh, today's a webinar features the kind of innovation we are hoping happens in programs and schools around the country. So we um, engaged professional collaborators in architecture, business, education, engineering, law, to say what are some new courses, new ways to work with communities together to envision the health of the population in the future. So we're thrilled today to um, present this webinar and two examples of folks who are um, creating innovative projects and ideas to help us all think about um, new ways we could work together. Takeaways for today, um, we want to illustrate two examples of practical frameworks for interdisciplinary curricular change. We want to reflect upon how the content and processes highlight examples relating to innovate, innovating one's own curriculum, and we want to describe successful methods for engaging faculty and building a shared vision. And I want to highlight again our expert panel um, about population health across professions emphasized that this kind of education must be bi-directional. We in public health will learn from our professional colleagues in architecture, business, law, members in the community, and vice versa. 
So this is a new spirit of collaboration, and we're excited to have our um, panelists today help us explore these ideas. Sarah? Thank you, Ruth. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our presenters today, who include Yvonne Michael, Associate Dean of Academic and Faculty Affairs and Professor of Epidemiology at Drexel University's Dornside School of Public Health. She's a social, social epidemiologist and leads research on the influence of the built and social environment on physical activity, obesity, and mobility. Dr. Michael co-leads Drexel's Center for Health and the Design and Designed Environment. Deborah Rubin is an Associate Professor in the Department of Architecture and Interiors at Drexel University and the Director of the Interior Design BS and MS program. Professor Rubin's research is focused on interdisciplinary design thinking and sustainability and participatory practices as they relate to human-centered approaches to community building. Professor Rubin is a co-leader of Drexel Center for Health in the Built Environment and co-founder of the Studio for Immersive Design and Engagement, a community-based learning laboratory documenting work and research in collaboration with community. And from the University of Kansas, Shannon Chris is a licensed architect and a, an associate professor in the architecture department at the University of Kansas. At KU, she's able to bring focus to community engagement processes and service learning opportunities to create an architecture that serves the greater good. Through externally funded research projects that incorporate design courses, she is able to engage urban communities of need in Wyandotte County. Shannon believes that by meeting people where they are, these real world experiences enhance the student perspective on what can be achieved when working with community insight as a guide to possible well-designed solutions. Shannon is a strong advocate to help students see their role as agents to connecting communities with design that promote environmental sustainability, social equity, and community resilience. Mega Ramaswamy is an associate professor of preventive medicine and public health at the University of Kansas School of Medicine. Her research has focused on how the intersection of urban living, race, class, and gender structure health and social risk for women and men involved in the criminal justice system. Current research addresses the social context for sexual and reproductive health risk among women leaving jail. Mega brings several years of experience as an undergraduate instructor, advisor, and field work coordinator. And Matt Kleinman is currently a doctoral student in architecture with a focus on public health at the University of Kansas. With a background in urban design and videography, Matt's work is focused on using community-based participatory research to help neighborhoods tell stories that promote greater access to healthy food and active living. Matt leverages narrative design as a democratic tool that can help shape public policy in order to reduce health disparities in the built environment through community engagement and participatory design. He believes that people should have the basic human right of living in a healthy neighborhood and that architectural designers can use their skills to promote greater health access for all. Thank you all for being here today. I will now turn it over to the team from Drexel. Great, thanks Sarah. I'm just trying to, uh, do we have it now? Yes, you do. <laughs> okay, great. Now okay, okay, great. Hi, everybody. Um, we're going to. Uh, this is Deb Rubin, and I'm going to present first, and then hand it over to Yvonne. Um, we're going to discuss a collaborative research project that has provided an opportunity for student teams from public health and design to learn together. We'll conclude by describing a course we offered this spring for design and public health students that is developed as a part of this collaborative work. Um, we know from our initial research that there is a link between play, space, physical activity, and social behavior. In fact, a literature review by Davison and Lawson in 2006 concluded that there is preliminary evidence that children's participation in physical activity is related to environmental attributes. Playgrounds were listed as one of the attributes, and studies concluded that there were significant links also in the proximity of public recreation and playgrounds to physical activity. However, I didn't have the tools to address that link until beginning a collaboration with Yvonne and her students a few years ago. In 2010, I spearheaded a design build for another schoolyard in West Philadelphia that was very similar in demographics to McMichael. I led a group of design students who worked with children in the classroom, conducted observations and numerous surveys with children, parents, and teachers, and facilitated community meetings all leading up to the construction. After the build, we realized that we wanted to know if there was measurable change around physical activity and social behavior during recess. We sent a survey to the faculty, lunch supervisors, and security personnel who oversaw recess. 
you can see the results here um, from an environmental design perspective and from play and learning psychology theories and our own intuition we knew this space changed the dynamics of play for the school. So the answers were not surprising. But we also knew that without pre-existing conditions, data, and a more scientific approach to our survey, that these results were um, anecdotal. Furthermore, they were not time-tested. There was still novelty here, uh, even though the surveys were conducted six months later. When we started the McMichael project in 2012, we were looking for a way to better document our findings by starting earlier in the process and connecting with researchers who had the expertise to study these questions. So this new relationship with design and public health has enabled us to explore this in more depth and as an interdisciplinary team of both faculty and students. Uh, the McMichael School is located in Mantua, a highly impoverished area of West Philadelphia, and is home to 450 children in kindergarten through eighth grade. The McMichael School falls within the Philadelphia Promise Zone, a two-square-mile section of West Philadelphia designated by the White House as a high-priority area focused on improving educational opportunities and housing, promoting economic development, and ensuring access to health and wellness resources. The Promise Zone program targets concentrated regions of deep and persistent poverty. 100% of the students attending McMichael in the 2015-16 school year were listed as economically disadvantaged. Um, the project goals included creating a safe and sustainable schoolyard that will build social capital and create a sense of place and space for increasing physical and social opportunities. The playground is currently devoid of any equipment. There is one large tree in the corner, and uneven concrete pavers make rigorous play treacherous. The children have described their environment as very windy, open space, hot or cold, depending on when we are working with them, but always with only two options, stand or play. They noted the lack of vegetation as well. Since 2012, students have interacted with McMichael children in five courses and independent research experiences. <clears throat> Student um, child workshops occur as part of the course and have covered several topics leading up to the design of the schoolyard. Um, children in grades two through five worked with design students on mapping their community, designing houses, building their neighborhood. Children discovered that their school is a vital part of their community and identified a long list of assets in their neighborhood, including parks, churches, murals, stores, library, and uh, other residents. In the second workshop series, children created pictures and clay models of imaginary places use, using donated art supplies. And they completed short questionnaires about their existing schoolyard and their ideas for a new space. Children shared drawings, models, and ideas for their vision of an ideal outdoor space with university students in um, a small group format. <clears throat> a third workshop was set up as a design charrette where children's outcomes and interviews um, used as inspiration for the design students yielded design ideas for the new schoolyard. These ideas were enriched by knowledge gathered through surveys conducted with teachers and parents behavior setting observations at other playgrounds, community research, and partnerships with local artists. Ideas were vetted through a participatory process with the students and children. Um, the first step in our design and health team research was to conduct a behavior setting study. Uh, design students observed children using the playground during recess and developed a detailed map of how the space was used. The behavior setting study provided the basis for the next step in our research, uh, quantifying physical activity and social behavior during recess using systematic observation. And um, Yvonne's going to talk more about the next steps in our research. Good morning. This is Yvonne. So this is where public health got involved. And um, we adapted a, an existing instrument the System for Observing Children's Activity and Relationships During Play, or SOCARP, um, which was developed in 2010 by Nikki Ridgers. And our goal was to work with um, design in order to quantify children's physical activity and social behavior on the playground before and after construction. So I involved uh, some students, uh, some students who were getting their Master's of Public Health, 
um, and working with me as part of a training grant we had for health disparities. And these students were trained alongside of graduate students in interior architecture and design uh, to use the modified instrument. The behavior setting study that the design students had completed was used to identify zones for systematic observation. And within each zone, we observed activity level, group size, activity type, and interactions for 10 10 second intervals for each target child. Teams of public health and design students observed play from the second floor of the school in the library. Researchers recorded their observations on a paper form and entered the data into a database. We con conducted observations approximately three days a week for four weeks in the spring of 2015, and the team worked together to evaluate the data. So just briefly, we found that the majority of the observed playground activity was moderate activity, such as standing or walking. Um, about a quarter of the observed activity was vigorous, and 7% um, was sedentary. In general, students were engaged in games and locomotion, walking, running, skipping, while on, while on the playground. Few students were engaged in organized um, activities, only about 9% of the observations. Girls were more likely than boys to be sedentary, and boys were more likely than girls to play organized sports. Based on this initial data collection, we determined that the instrument was appropriate, but in order to scale up this research, we wanted to develop a more efficient data collection method. So we recruited a graduate student from the Department of uh, Digital Media in Drexel's Westfall College of Media Arts and Design to develop an application that would allow us to collect data electronically on a handheld device. An easy to use interface would make data collection more efficient and also more accurate because it reduced errors during recording and eliminated data entry errors. Our public health researchers met with a digital media student to explain the data collection instrument and to brainstorm the design of the app. The app uses easy to understand graphics and allows data collectors to swipe through screens. The app times the intervals and alerts data collectors to start and end data collection. The app automatically records time and temperature and can be pre-programmed by the administrator with key details about the school and the data collectors. The data is automatically downloaded into a database stored on the internet. During this process, we learned that app development is iterative and thus takes longer than we initially imagined. Also, working with students can take longer than working with professional designers. We realized we needed a front-end designer to develop the user-friendly interface and a back-end designer to develop the data processing capabilities. We have viewed an initial functional version of the app, so we're super excited, but needed to send it back to the developer for a few more tweaks. We hope to collect some initial data using the app in the next couple of weeks. The McMichael Playground construction will occur next winter with planned completion in April 2015, uh, 2017. Sorry. So this timing works perfectly um, well for us as we have ample time in the fall to perfect the data collect collecting pre-construction and we'll be able to collect new data in the spring of 2017. One exciting outgrowth of this project was the development of the Health and Design Research class we offered this spring, along with another Westfall School of Design faculty member, Dee Nicholas. The interprofessional course was open to undergraduate and graduate students in Westfall College and graduate students in the School of Public Health. The goal of the course was to introduce students to the process of design thinking in relation to a public health issue. Design thinking is a creative problem-solving approach that can be used to improve population health and address complex public health problems. In multidisciplinary teams, the students developed case studies based on real-world public health issues. We shifted our focus a bit, and the focus for this initial offering was housing and security. We partnered with a local behavioral health funder, the Scattergood Foundation, to provide this course. The course was fully enrolled with 10 public health students and 9 design students. We just finished the course last week, um, but initial reports were highly favorable. One student noted that collaboration with other disciplines gives me a wider perspective. One design student indicated that she learned about theoretical research models from public health students in our group that pertains to our topic. 
One public health student indicated that the course helped her to learn to visualize ideas. The MPH degree is very writing intensive, but we need these visual visualization tools to be able to better organize our ideas. These tools are useful for tasks most public health practitioners take up, like program development and evaluation. We plan to develop a case study describing this interdisciplinary course this summer for sharing, and we'll use the information from this year to inform an updated course that will be offered next year. So we should be able to see a video um, just showing some still pictures from the course. Um, but you can see our students um, and their engagement in a variety of activities. Um, and while you're watching this, I'll read a quote uh, from one of our students um, who just completed the course. The Public Health and Design course is a magnificent model for how to use interprofessional education and collaboration. I have been able to see myself grow professionally through better interpersonal skills, opening my mind to new possibilities for solutions, and proving to myself that I can be creative. After taking this course, I feel that interprofessional education and collaboration needs to happen more at the graduate level because of the applicable professional skills learned and innovative solutions that can come out of this process. So we can actually, Sarah, you can just cut it off at this point. So thanks for listening. We look forward to your questions. Thank you, Yvonne and Deborah. I'm going to now uh, turn it over to the team from Kansas in just a moment. But just as a reminder, please uh, don't hesitate to submit your questions via the question box uh, at any time during these presentations. They're going to speak over here. Get the slides to activate here. All right, so can you all hear me? Thank you all so much for having us. Um, I don't know how to get back to the previous slide. It's okay. Um, so we're going to talk about the relationship between, thank you, between um, health and design um, and talk specifically about a course that we developed and implemented that address the built environment and its relationship with public health. And when I say built environment, we focus specifically on neighborhood walkability, so public parks, and access to healthy food via local grocery stores. Um, Sarah, thank you for introducing us um, and the other presenters. I just want to also acknowledge Nikki Nolan, who's one of the co-investigators on this project, um, who couldn't be here, um, so hopefully we will do her justice. So this course um, was designed in the context of our Master of Public Health program. And for those of you who are familiar with MPH programs, we embedded this project within the core social and behavioral health course. So traditionally, our social and behavioral health course had really focused on behavioral change theory. Um, and increasingly, we've been talking about health disparities and the social determinants of health. But one thing that we have always struggled with was to figure out how to give students a fieldwork experience that would help them see the social determinants of health in action. Um, and by doing this collaboration with architecture to sort of understand what the built environment looks like on the ground and how that relates to public health, we thought we could achieve that goal. So we also are in a particular location um, that sort of highlights the incredible income and health inequality um, that our residents face. The University of Kansas School of Medicine is in Wyandotte County, so in the state of Kansas. Wyandotte County is one of the poorest counties in the state. Um, per the Robert Wood Johnson um, health rankings, Wyandotte County also ranks 101 out of 105 counties in poor health. We also butt right up against Johnson County, which is one of the wealthiest counties per capita in the country, um, and also ranks number one in health. 
Um, and so we see the disparities in income, in education, in race, and certainly in health every day. And we really wanted this course to be able to address some of those inequities. So we, uh, in architecture, we're in Lawrence, Kansas, and the KU Med Center of Public Health is in uh, Kansas City, Wyandotte County. So we're separated by 35 miles. So this poses a sort of uh, problem when you think about cross-disciplinary collaborative process. Uh, so we um, creatively, using this grant, um, tried to figure out how to um, establish these new relationships, and, and we hadn't really worked together before. Um, by uh, working together through the internet, but also in spaces in Kansas City, we had the goal of developing tools that could bring us together um, to bring uh, understanding how design and health impact um, in two neighborhoods, just as mentioned. Um, predominantly looking at Wyandotte Health, Wyandotte County inequities, but also looking at the Johnson County um, spaces and access to food and exercise. Um, we adapted the community-based participatory research approach. This was certainly not a full-blown CDPR process, but we definitely wanted to introduce the students to the idea of engaging community members, talking with them, getting community members to help identify some of the problems and also the strengths of communities. And we um, practice public interest design or participatory design where we uh, meet people where they are um, in spaces in the city, looking at spatial connections and relationships, uh, another form of CBPR, but one that perhaps is more visual and interactive um, in, in spaces in the city. Uh, Undue protocols. So undue is understanding neighborhood determinants um, of health. When we develop these protocols, uh, we adapted them um, from work that had been going on um, at our institution through an American Indian Center for Health. We've been doing some of these studies of neighborhoods. Um, and of course, these protocols have been adapted from the peer-reviewed literature. Uh, we worked them to sort of fit with the goals of this project, was to really understand community level walkability, uh, nutritional food access. And so then we uh, worked together last fall to adapt uh, those with women, infant, children, Kansas standards to start to look at what does access to healthy food mean? What are the, the um, list or the kind of um, food types that people um, would want to carry in grocery stores? So this talk, we're going to really focus on um, the food part of our coursework and our research. Um, this is interesting just to kind of think about um, the Wyandotte County and the relationship to healthy food access. Um, we also adapted the tool to incorporate uh, analysis of uh, the store, so from a kind of um, layout, um, from the kind of environmental ambiance, and from wayfinding. We were looking at different types of questions that we might look at in ana analyzing a grocery store. Also, Matt developed this um, nice online tool. You all can um, access it, but what's great about it is it teaches how to draw a three-dimensional uh, floor plan of a, of a grocery store. And so the students were really learning how to think about the relationship of the building to the outside, the interior um, relationships between people spaces and food storage spaces, and what impacts those have on our access and thinking about relationship to food. Uh, the uh, area that we chose to work in is um, half of the population and about a quarter of the, um, the, the county. This is in Wyandotte County. Uh, we found uh, we've been working there for the last three years and have got to know a lot of um, partners, community partners there, and identified six neighborhoods that represented the full range of uh, community cultures, uh, African American, Latino, and um, Caucasian. And it's nicely distributed. Uh, we had 20 public health students and 12 architecture students, so we broke them up into six different teams, um, connecting them with um, assigned grocery stores and parks and community members. Uh, this, what I will now describe is a kind of five-step process in the course. First, we discovered each other, each other's um, <laughs> disciplines, the way we think about things, the way we approach research. Uh, this was done through, uh, you know, remotely via interactive classroom environment. Um, it was a good challenge to figure out how to really create that kind of personal connection um, through the internet. But what was really great about that was we were exposing the students to different films and ways to think about 
um, this topic the students presented to each other. They started to hear and um, learn the vocabulary and the ideas that each discipline um, studies. The uh, second part of this um, coursework was to look at the engagement. Um, we have a, a storefront space in Wyandotte County that we, we have access to where the students met with each other, but they also met with the residents from the community. And this was a great chance for them to break down into their six teams and really get to know each other. So we've had this background of research and now we're really starting to kind of hear the stories. Um, we started a photo voice process where we gave out cameras to our resident uh, partners. And then in step three, uh, we uh, spent the time for the next three or four weeks where the residents went out in their communities and looked for um, documented health disparities, um, talked to their neighbors, really um, became familiar and I think in a way thought about through kind of design process in a way, what are the assets and the challenges of their own communities. The same with the students, they use the undo protocols to go out and observe, um, really um, make some um, you know, careful determinant of what were the factors in the built environment and thinking about the access to healthy food. And fourth, uh, reporting. The students then presented um, their information to each other and to the community partners. Um, this was great because the students really, um, I think, um, were listening and they, they took the photos and they put them on the board. They started to mark and make comments. And that was really nice because I think the students um, began to um, hear and had been in the communities, really understood uh, the, the challenges and were able to um, maybe uh, correct some of their thinking or expand their thinking through the communication with the, with the residents. And finally, um, we had a reflection um, period where the students exhibited their work. We had over 100 um, people come to this exhibit at the end of the semester, um, inviting the residents back so that they could see how the students were listening, um, how they were interpreting the information, and how they were proposing new design proposals. The architecture students had developed uh, ways of thinking about addressing these, these stores. Um, what was nice too is we had uh, policymakers and public representatives, um, foundations, folks that really could take these ideas and help us take it to the next level. Um, some of the new tools, this on the left, you can see uh, the students use the um, SketchUp tool to create an existing analysis of um, what were the factors. There were bars in the windows, there were advertising in the windows that one wouldn't allow daylight in. There were um, uh, allocated spaces that could be reconsidered for better access to food, um, the need for, gross, for um, refrigeration um, for the healthy food, and et cetera. Um, on the right, you can see the proposed changes where students, um, in small ways, made a series of possible interventions better light. Matt, go ahead. You can. Yeah, so uh, part of the, the results of the assessments came about in that uh, part of my PhD research was supported through a 1422 grant from the CDC to improve access to food and physical activity. And one of the things that they had asked us to do was to look at the WIC um, access in Wyandotte County. Uh, the WIC department knew that they had 16 stores that were WIC access available, but only a three of them were in the target areas that we defined where over half the population lives. So there's a limited accessibility, especially when you consider transportation and walkability as a factor of how do you access a grocery store. So what in the assessments the students did, we specifically looked at non-WIC stores to see what could become WIC. And the student work actually informed greatly, and you see in this example, one on the left, one on the right, Fast Fred's Market is a um, a, a part of Wyandotte County where almost everyone that comes there comes on foot traffic and they have some barriers um, but even in the visitation between the students the first and the second time the owner of the store was responding to this notion of design changing the built environment and health he had actually kind of reorganized the shelving units to provide more of the fresh food up front um, on the store on the right El Torito it's a, a bodega a grocery store but uh, the WIC department didn't know it existed so in this conversation with them, we are now raising the opportunity to go to WIC and say, well, we know that you don't have skim milk on the shelves or fresh juice or canned salmon. But if you get those three things, now you can apply and be a WIC vendor, which serves a need for about 9,000 people within a half mile walking distance of Wyandotte County. So the, the work that the students do actually does now have a real benefit going forward. 
Uh, some of the one comment the student discovered was um, the residents that she had learned so much through this process of documenting, meeting her neighbors, talking about some of the issues, and it brought out a, a kind of new focus and a new way of uh, communicating. Uh, I think the student appreciated that, and actually she commented that she herself went back to her own community and started to think about um, her access and the issues that her neighborhoods face. I think in some of the reflections from the students, our public health students were a little bit frustrated um, with the process to the extent that we had not adequately trained them to be immersed in the community. This was not a full-blown CBPR project. It was an introduction to community engagement. Um, and the students, I think, felt ill-prepared for coming in, engaging one or two times with community members, and then leaving never to come back again. Um, so that certainly gives us some, sorry, something to think about um, as we move forward in terms of really doing a good community engagement process. And at the end, we're going to share a video if we have time at the end of questions. Um, I think, you know, in, in reflecting um, and moving into the final comments, um, as we taught it, it was a guided instruction where we uh, last fall developed the protocols, um, set up the photo voice, uh, really started to kind of lay out the course. Um, I think this is um, a good first um, uh, way to go. But if we were to think about um, with further, further iteration next year, could we, in fact, see ourselves more as interprofessional facilitators where um, the community, the engagement with the community, the um, store assessments, um, the protocols, all of these things could be generated in the course. And, and, and like the design thinking process, um, you learn what works, what doesn't, and you modify things as they go. And finally, um, some lessons that we learned, um, be flexible in the spirit of collaboration, um, really allow for more time um, for the students to mentor each other. This is really valuable. So we had um, undergraduate architecture students and graduate public health students, and I think that we failed to appreciate what the differences in learning style was between those two groups. Mm -hmm. um, and we really could have capitalized on the ability of the older public health students um, and their ability to mentor the undergraduates and thinking, I think, more critically about how, what we could have learned from the undergraduate students and capitalizing on that difference. Um, rather than just ignoring it and pretending like it would work itself out. We, of course, had technological issues, which we resolved in real time. We got better classrooms, called on our IT people. Um, those were the ways in which we had to be flexible throughout the process. And it starts to change the way our schools actually think about this technology and the potential for us to really um, reach out with other disciplines. I also think we needed um, learning, um, being more flexible, uh, with the community residents and, and really their time. So meeting on a Monday afternoon from 1 to 4 is a time when most people are at work or at school. So thinking through potentially an evening or weekend um, relationship events there. Be playful, um, really um, iterative, um, cannot um, learn enough from uh, doing it and then doing it again and doing it again. The students, I think, could learn from each other transfer knowledge. Yeah, I mean, I think the sort of biggest strength of this collaboration was the connection between the design and public health cultures. Um, it's, you know, this is the way we are moving in public health. And I think this was a really nice experiment in trying to um, facilitate this relationship through the academic process. And then thinking strategically, I think, is um, a great thing to think about, that everything is designed, um, every process, the way the tools that we develop. And it's always um, a work in progress, um, really helping students um, learn to approach um, public health outcomes in, with different tools and to figure out through the coursework what might be the best ways to do this. Um, thank you, and look at all the people that were involved in this course. It was really um, fantastic. Thank you, thank you um, both of our sets of presenters. These are uh, great illustrations of, I think, what all our new um, uh, uh, reports in public health are dreaming of, the kind of innovation and creativity to bring professionals together. It sounds like you had the bi-directional conversations as faculty and students that we are excited about, that we think we need to be doing with across many professions. Um, I guess. One question I'd like to start with, and then Sarah, uh, maybe you can follow up with any questions we have um, sent in. Um, 
you just alluded in your recent comments at the end to one of the benefits was talking about the different cultures of the different professions. And this includes language, this includes ethics, this includes values. I mean, that was part of our report we heard. You know, we're really different, even though we're all professions and we're all committed to the same goals of a healthy public or a healthy community. Um, it's hard to get down to the nitty gritty and talk. Were there any lessons learned about um, facilitating that conversation in a deeper way that you might use the next time, even at the beginning of the course, to facilitate that kind of deeper conversation among of, of, of faculty? And, and maybe both groups could talk about culture, culture change or culture, um, cross-culture thinking. I will comment that I think we all shared the same values. We started the course with a section on the social determinants of health um, and talked a lot about income and educational inequality. Mm -hmm. um, and I think both groups of students really understood that. Mm -hmm. The sort of academic culture bridging was a little bit more difficult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think, um, you know, I think even uh, really trying to immerse them together from the start. Um, it's interesting just that even now we're talking through this technology. Um, how do you establish really meaningful um, relationships? Because I think when discussing values, it really does become those kind of personal conversations. So um, I think that ultimately halfway through the semester, we were really starting to learn more and more about each other's disciplines, but um, we needed to be together from the beginning to mm -hmm. sort of bridge some of the academic cultural gaps. Well, that would be the uh, others will too, but will you join just before we get to the next one? Um, anything differently? Like will you have them read a piece of literature together and talk about it? Or I just wonder what does the facilitation mean for the next time? Do you, mm -hmm. have, you, have you thought about that? Do you have social get-togethers? Um, you know, yeah, I mean, maybe even eating healthy food and talking about that. Maybe it starts with the party rather than ends with it. Um, <laughs> the residents, you know, really get to the subject right away. I, um, I, would add one, um, I attended the National uh, ASVPH conference, and one of the panelists actually had a really great example. Uh, they had the students of the two different disciplines take a test, and they were, of course, going to fail on the answers not related to their discipline. And then after they took the test, they took a test right afterwards where they got to work together in groups. And then they got to identify, well, there's a knowledge base that this discipline has that can help me answer the test that I didn't have previously. I think there is some of that, how do we structure that initial engagement where the students can start to talk to each other and identify where, there's, where they might have a gap in their skill set professionally that can benefit by solving a problem working together. So I'll just uh, add in really quickly, um, uh, just to speak to the last comment about healthy food, we did actually have the students eat together throughout the quarter. Um, but we always brought in pizza, so forget that. <laughs> they laughed, they laughed that the, the public health class was like uh, bringing in pizza, but um, but we did. We we made a point of um, the class was at the end of the day, and we 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 found that sitting together and talking as like in a family style meal um, is some, a little different than the work you do in class. But we also did have our students together in. Um, interdisciplinary groups from pretty much the very beginning and they were hands-on since we were doing design thinking work, human-centered design work, um, we walked them through the entire process so they were problem-solving together from the very beginning and many of the students expressed fear um, about being in a, a mixed group, fear that they wouldn't um, uh, be able to talk to the other um, but they learned very quickly that they had incredibly complementary skills and um, and I think as you heard in one of the quotes that I read, you know, the public health students realized that they actually could be creative and I think the design students really appreciated learning a little bit about how the um, how to use research in a more quantitative way. So um, I, I felt like our, our interdisciplinary groups were fantastic, like I couldn't believe how well they went. Those groups were better than groups I've had in classes of entirely public health students. Um, they work together so well. I think mentoring, um, so at the beginning, could the public health students have taught the research skills and really the architecture students could then learn and then uh, apply that. I think vice versa, could the public health students see the student architecture students in action, but then use, develop their floor plan, they're, you know, like really use the, the skill set. Like, uh,
may have given them more appreciation or, um, I, I guess, uh, ability to kind of imagine how to use uh, that relationship for a stronger purpose. These are great comments. Thank you. Sarah, do you have some questions? Yes, we do have a few questions from the question mark. Just as a reminder, we are taking questions, so please submit your questions by typing them into the question box. Uh, one of the questions, uh, it says, great project, and I believe that this can refer to either, either of your projects. Uh, again, in reference to culture, did the group experience any feedback from the community based on cultural differences? Um. I mean, our students certainly perceived difference, um, as I think the comment we presented reflected. They perceived difference, and I think as researchers, it's something we always struggle with. How do you get into the community and leave the community without, you know, abandoning them? Uh, I don't know about yeah. the, the community members. It's, it's, it's interesting, because one of the community members, um, African American, was actually, um, they had a, a Latino community store, you know, three blocks away, but they weren't going there to shop. They were going, driving two miles away. Um, and so there was a certain um, language barrier for that community member. The students experience the same thing, right? So they're going in the stores and they're not really understanding the language. They're not really um, understanding some of the foods and how to, to use those. So I think um, in both ways, the residents and the students were um, experiencing these kind of gaps. So that was really enlightening, I think. Great, oh. thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, in our course, um, the students did do some community-based work um, in that they reached out to, for the most part, community leaders and um, leaders in, the, in specific community-based organizations as part of their deep dive research um, for the design challenge. So they did um, expert interviews. Um, one of the groups got to actually be a participant, observer of a um, homeless, uh, of, of women in a homeless shelter um, who had children, and they were able to be part of that circle um, while they were sharing their experiences, which was really powerful for that particular group. But all of the, all of the groups got to work as groups in reaching out to the community, but it, um, less than what you did in your class, so less experience, I think, there. Great. Thank you both. Um, this person has asked, um, how the courses originally started? Did they evolve from the School of Public Health or the School of Architecture or Design? Um, just and, and I wanted to add to that, how did you find each other? <laughs> yeah. Well, we, um, uh, Design Plus Health Consortium, it's a national group, um, we applied for that and that really gave us the impetus to meet each other. Um, so that started two years ago. It's through the American Institutes of Architects. That was interesting to me because I really began to, um, you know, even like have initial conversations, um, it forced us into that in a way. Um, but the class was really started through public health. You've been teaching this for many years, I think Nikki has. So, um, you know, we've kind of adapted um, our um, capacity to, to the original course. And we, had, we have tried to establish these relationships, relationships with architecture in the past and have offered a built environment course um, when I came to Kansas. I don't know, about six years ago, and then never again, just because, you know, things are constantly changing. Mm -hmm. um, and this, like I said, really gave us an opportunity to move from a health behavior change theory-based course to one that is not only looking at the social determinants of health, but is looking at them on the ground. I mean, I think the drive in our MPH program has really been to give students meaningful fieldwork-based experiences throughout the curriculum, um, and this was a great way to do that. Mm -hmm. And our architecture students have, I think, capacity to visualize and to map and do these things, but I think um, finding that special purpose and really um, using other expertise to provide that kind of new way of using those tools um, is very, very important for our students' education. But I'm sorry, so we've been working together actually um, for, I don't know, maybe four or five years. Yeah. Um, and then applied together to the AIA Design and Health Consortium. Um, and I think that's really helped to cement our, our relationship and provide um, some, some support, albeit not financial, um, for our work together. Um, and uh, the course itself that we taught was uh, an elective in both, uh, in, the pro in the different programs. Um, uh, so it wasn't a, a, a core course. 
um, but it was cross-listed. So there was a section that was um, available only for MPH students, and there was a section that was available for um, uh, undergrad and grad uh, design students. Um, and then we would have accepted people outside of public health and design if there was space, but the class filled up, so we, we weren't able to do that. Great to know that demand is high. <laughs> Uh, this question is for the University of Kansas Public Health. How would or will you better prepare students for community engagement? Uh, is frustration a fruitful learning experience in and of itself? Our students often express frustration with not being prepared enough to do this type of work. So I think that, you know, in our department we're all community researchers and I work in jail so sometimes we work sort of in these sketchy communities on the margins, and we know a lot about that. We know how to get into the community. I think what we did is fail to share that information with our students. Um, so we have this knowledge, and I think from the jump, we just have to do a better job at preparing students for what that looks like, how to negotiate their own cultural capital in the community. Um, and we just didn't do that. We assumed we would just throw them in, and that was a wrong assumption. And through this, maybe we need to tighten our scope, you know, so maybe it's not all um, food and um, parks and physical activity, but tighten it up. Um, it's the time piece that I think is hard um, because to teach those skills would take something else away. Important, but this is, this is a, these are the lessons you learn teaching. And we also learned that it was incredibly valuable to the students to be able to negotiate this. I don't think we would have anticipated that had they not given us that feedback. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just the one student who had given us that feedback. So for those of us who struggle with this question too, what are some concrete examples like to prepare them? Do you do role playing? Do you show film clips? Do you like pretend about the situations before? How do you do it? So I think, I mean, on my own research team and with my own students, um, you know, we parade in community-based researchers and say, ask these researchers, how do you get into the community um, and how do you present yourself? Right? So, you know, with my jail staff, the rap I always give is you have to understand what the multiple traumas are that these populations have faced, and it is always about just establishing um, respect and listening and having this no judgment zone. Um, our Latino Health Center at KU, they would probably say that we operate on a um, CBPR framework. We embed ourselves. We get tons of community feedback. We also have an American Indian Health Research Team here that is really led by the community. That's a different model that I employ in my own research. Um, you know, but we would parade them in and have them talk about how important it is for the community to be dictating to them what their research agenda should be. Um, so I think that would be my concrete advice, is to parade in community-based researchers and have them give real-world examples of how they negotiate some of these issues. Um, you know, we don't do role play, we don't show videos, I think it's just, you know, it's our experiences that have, you know, made us comfortable with doing this work. And I would add to, to Megan's comment, as an architecture doctoral student, I'm, I'm aware of that too. I think we're we're in the same boat in terms of how to work with communities. I think it's a lot of just been about listening, but I'm, uh, Mega mentioned the, the Native American CDPR group. I've, I've taken coursework as an architecture doctoral student with uh, the director of that institute, and I'll be in two weeks with them um, South Dakota in a Native American reservation just observing and learning about how to better incorporate CDP, CDPR into the design process. I think there's a lot of there's a lot of jargon gets, that gets thrown around, but when I look at participatory design and CDPR, um, the links are there. I think it's just a, from the faculty perspective, being able to allow the students to kind of discover that narrative between themselves and then work with that with the communities in mind from the very beginning. I also think we have expert citizens that we can draw on. Um, building this relationship over time, um, there are some very articulate and thoughtful people leading um, church groups or small groups or nonprofits. They are our teachers. They can come in and really give the perspectives from their from their neighborhoods and help the students learn this. And process. tell the students how to interact with the community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, find those proper places or those, those most meaningful ways to intersect. Um, sometimes I think we, we set up the curriculum, the course, the timing, but really having them help us design the course from the start might be a really good way to do this. And I, I think also the students need to understand they're working in partnership with the community. They're not doing something for the community. And that's been something um, in, I think, 
the courses that we all teach that involve community, where the community is uh, more of a partner at the table um, and engaging the students in things like storytelling from the community's perspective um, and engaging the community in the research as, as far as the public health research and data gathering. Um, so the, the um, students in the community are really working um, together, almost like they're all in one class. We also have um, a center off, off campus that is um, a community center um, that really kind of engages um, both the community and our college students and faculty. And there's a lot of opportunity to teach side-by-side -side courses there where we're teaching some courses where the, um, it's half community and half um, students. Um, so that's another place I think that um, we could engage in our classes um, with the Dorn Sife Center um, as, as we kind of move our ideas forward. That would be a great model for us. I mean, I would love to be able to, I think as Drexel had done, to be able to open this up to not just our KU students, but, you know, bring these, because there were young people in the community that are college students, so why not bring them in, um, you know, as students who are just taking the class and participating in the activities. It's a good model. Thank you for that suggestion. Wonderful. I don't think we'll have time to get to all the questions, but a few more, um, maybe one or two. Have you all been able to reach out or engage the private sector at all? Uh, related to food access, some of the work we've been doing has got the attention of uh, Humana Health Insurance, and they've reached out to us to potentially uh, design and prototype and build um, a grocery store mobile market that's based a lot largely upon the research and the mapping work we're doing. So. I think as, as missions align within the private sector, especially from certain health industries, yes, there is definitely an interest there. I think part of our challenge is how do we, are we the right people to approach the private sector? Sometimes we, there's a whole barrier of middlemen of the, the institutions and the endowments who want to have a part of that conversation, and we have to be respectful of the process. But absolutely, the private sector is, is I think, becoming more aware for us. Yeah, thank you. And then the last question. Um, how are you all promoting or disseminating your work to encourage and enable implementation by others? Um, well, we no, just in the ASVPH, Matt did that. He presented there um, the conference this, this spring. Um, I've uh, submitted to the ACSA, the American Schools of Collegiate of Architecture um, program, and um, present papers that way. Um, we actually, this work has really gotten some interest from the community members, so I think um, we're going to see a future um, support for the course um, through partnerships in Kansas City. Uh, so here, I, I, we're, we're going to work on, as I indicated, um, for, for both the um, uh, McMichael Schoolyard project as well as for the course, we're working this summer to develop some case studies that um, would be publicly available and then working also to develop more um, uh, peer-reviewed uh, papers for dissemination. And, and while I'm not speaking to the, 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 the peer review process, um, I think just video storytelling is really powerful. I mean, we have a short video clip, they have, uh, Drexel has a short video clip, and even the, the YouTube tutorial I've done, I mean, I, I did that for an audience of about a dozen architecture students and yet it's been viewed 120 times in a couple months. I imagine the more we can put the tools out there and let not only our students tell their stories, but the community members tell their stories about how these projects are working together, I think that helps raise the awareness overall for more people to engage with, not just now. I think sharing the protocols and some of the tools we've developed to get more feedback for others to try it, to um, really help each other grow this um, insight would be helpful, whether it's specific to specific areas. I mean, maybe a change based on um, local needs. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. And um, as for that video link, we will be sure to send it out to all registrants webinar uh, following today's webinar once uh, the, this recording is uh, up and ready to go. I want to say thank you to Ruth, Yvonne, Deborah, Shannon, Mega, and Matt for all um, for your presentations today and for being involved. Um, you're doing some great work. We're very excited about it and can sense, certainly sense your enthusiasm as well. Uh, as I said, this webinar will be, it has been recorded and will be available on the ASPPH website uh, soon. And uh, we will send out uh, a follow-up email indicating when it is available for you to view. 
There are, please also remember to uh, check out additional webinars in the ASCPH uh, Presents webinar series. And be sure to contact us with any additional questions. Please save the date for the 2017 ASCPH Annual Meeting and 2017 Undergraduate Public Health and Global Health Education Summit to be held in Arlington, Virginia. And additionally, please note that the registration will be opening in July for the 2016 ACSA ASCPH Fall Conference the first ever joint conference between the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture and Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health. Uh, it will connect academics, practitioners, and policymakers who are exploring issues at the intersection of design, the built environment, and public health at all scales, from materials to buildings to landscapes to urban and social systems. Thank you all again, and this webinar is now adjourned. Thank you. Yes. Thank you.